Welcome to the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. We are a hundred plus year old organization that every Thursday just about, Rain China Quasi Apocalypse, has met and gathered to discuss, disseminate, and share adventure and life off the beaten path. Uh, my name is Andrew McGregor, and it is my profound honor and privilege to welcome to the stage and have a conversation with Greg Drowning. Downing, not drowning. That's that's another adventure. That's another adventure. I know, a whole other thing. Great, all right. You are now on the interwebs worldwide. Uh, Greg, thank you for coming, and why are you here talking to us? Yeah, well, um, so, I worked on a project that was telling a story about the first female shaman uh, in a region of the Amazon that hadn't had a female shaman in maybe 10,000 years. Hmm. Uh, can you give a, a bit of the, the context, both geographically, culturally, and historically, of what that community was going through, uh, what were the events that led yeah. to her ascension, if that's the correct word, and things like that? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, this is a culture that is, it's located, and I believe we have a map that we can look at. Um, so it's uh, uh, deep in the Amazon uh, along Rio Gregory. It's in the Acre region of Brazil. It's butted up right next to the border with Peru. Uh, if you look at the size of Brazil, it's close to the edge. Um, so it's a place that's near the headwaters. And um, it's an ancient culture that uh, was, has survived you know, a number of um, difficulties with contact with the West. Uh, but then uh, in the 1940s, uh, uh, there was a period of enslavement that lasted until the 1980s. And a lot of the culture was lost. Um, and it was regained from a few individuals uh, whose families trained them through that hardship. And um, most recently, uh, th there have been, you know, reviving the shamanic practice and really bringing new life uh, to that practice. What was the nature of enslavement? And then numerically, how close was this society to annihilation? Yeah, so there was kind of a... Uh, uh, a one-two punch that was going on, uh, uh, that historically uh, there was a need for rubber uh, during World War II, um, and uh, there were rubber barons that uh, took the land from the people who uh, lived there and owned it and enslaved those people and clear-cut their land and created rubber plantations. And uh, they went through this, this rough period uh, until uh, the 1980s. So it was relatively recent. And the interesting thing about the Yamanawa, uh, which is this amazing, rich, today is this rich, uh, brave culture, they, um, they were able to kind of renew and revive all of that culture. And they went through an extremely small soda straw of uh, uh, a, a small number of individuals, and one individual primarily that was their former shaman uh, uh, who was trained by his family in uh, the shamanic practices during that period. So like, how many people were left after the rubber plant? Was it hundreds, thousands, dozens? Yeah, I, uh, approximately 90% of uh, the people were wiped out uh, during that period. So they went from a population of a few thousand uh, down to a population of 225. Hmm. Um, so they've since been uh, renewing their population and, and building it up again and reclaiming uh, their culture and, and getting it back. And the specific story that we're telling is that now that they, they, they have been getting their culture back, um, they made a, a transformation. They changed a... Uh, an ancient process for uh, uh, having shamans, and they made a change that improved their society significantly. And uh, that was due to individuals that were just certain that they 
um, Hushahu, who's the the subject of the film that we made. Uh, yeah, give us a, a cast yeah, of characters. Yeah, let's, let's, go do back. The, let's do the Wes let's Anderson play thing. Like, who, yeah, who, who, yeah, I think so, we, we went way yeah. too deep early. Uh, so you have the, the elder shaman who's the the last inheritor of this incredible culture yeah. and all the knowledge. Yeah. He's at the end of his life. He survived the rubber plantation that was brought about by allied needs for that resource in World War II. Yeah. And then he's like, I need to pass this on. How does he decide? And then this, this woman will come. How did she decide to become the shaman? Who were the other shamans yeah. in the community? Can you like give us that yeah. landscape? So uh, the story that we're telling is the story of Hushahu. And Hushahu is a shaman uh, in, among the Yawanawan people. And when from her earliest days, when she was six years old, uh, she would steal the visionary medicine, uh, uh, which they call uni, uh, uh, which here we know as ayahuasca. She would steal the medicine that only the men were allowed to consume. And she would take it and she would go on, she would have visions. And she was certain from the earliest ages that, that she was meant to be a shaman. She knew from the beginning that she wanted to be shaman. She knew that the culture didn't allow it, but she was certain. So over time, she was able to convince the older shaman, Tata, that she should be trained. And Tata had the, um, the, the good reasoning to, to allow her to do that. And then how many shamans are in the community? Is it one? Are there several? Is it a plurality? Is there, it like a... Yeah, there, there, are, there are multiple shamans, um, but she is the first female shaman among them. And what was the cultural blowback, if that's the right word, or was it just a discomfiture with change kind of thing? There, there was a lot of concern. There was concern among her family, uh, the, uh, the, the process of becoming a shaman is a very intensive, uh, long, intensive, difficult process. Uh, how long, and do you have any details of yeah. what's particularly agonizing sure. about it? Sure, yeah. uh, a 15-month long process. Okay. Um, and the process involves, uh, the first step in the process uh, is taking a, uh, a plant medicine that they call muka, and um, muka is meant only for shamans. Only shamans are allowed to take it. It's a, um, it's a very strong visionary medicine that is uh, permanent. So once you, you take that, you never quite return to your previous state. And in addition to that, you, uh, you take the uni, which is the ayahuasca. That's a daily process. Uh, and then that's taken while you're on a restricted diet. Uh, you're separated from the rest of the culture. You're in a different place. Uh, you spend your time, you know, in reflection and prayer, and you're tested. And your the previous shaman is giving you the training. And some of that training inv involves uh, medicines that make it difficult to breathe. Uh, um, uh, where you have to be uh, submerged in water. Um, you are on a, a restricted diet. Uh, so uh, Hushahu describes uh, having a banana a day with a little bit of corn. Um, and so you're on a restricted diet. Uh, you're drinking snake poisons, uh, a whole series of, of trials while you're... Um, influenced by the visionary medicines. And it's, it's a very long process, and it it's a, requires a lot of endurance as well. So there was a lot of concern among her family that she wouldn't survive this process. How old was she when she embarked on that? That's a good question. I'm not sure of her, her exact age. Over 18, under 18? Like... Uh, I think she was at least 18, I'm, I'm guessing. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I know that... Um, you know, uh, in in that culture, like they start very early uh, with the uni. Like that's that's something that um, 
now, after this uh, kind of revolution that occurred within the culture, that they, they, they start as children. The shaman process starts? Or? No, not the shaman process, the, but the, but the consumption. taking, taking yeah. Can you talk a little about that? Because if you hang out in certain um, LA coffee shops, you'll hear ayahuasca referred to almost as a pizza topping, right? Right. Um, <laughs> so, but what is the cultural context of unir ayahuasca? Like, what does it mean? Yeah. How is it utilized? Sure. Right? Uh, it, it's a sacred process. It's done within the context of ceremony. And it's something that uh, the entire community participates in. It's something that um, they do when uh, there's the need for, um, so for instance, if, if you have a, a relative that's ill, uh, you would go and you would, you, would, you would take part in the process and pray for your relative. Um, it's a spiritual undertaking. Um, it's something that you do when you feel that you need it. It's not um, an obligation that, that you would have to return to it, but it's something that is done on a fairly regular basis. Like maybe, um, I, I asked the chief about this and he said maybe they, they do it like um, a couple of times a month, or something hmm. like that. Would you describe it as a state of intoxication or how, how does the, the sense of a communal experience play into this as opposed to like the Western idea of like I do drugs or something or I yeah, take the medicine, they, right? it's, um, it's, it's done in the context of ceremony. So it's, uh, it's not uh, something as far as I know that they do kind of privately and on hmm. their own. Um, and it's, it's done with a spiritual purpose. Um, so, oh, ah, we have some, visuals. We've got some visuals. Um, and, I, and, and just to give this a little more context, yeah. um, uh, you know, this uh, project, I, actually, maybe I could rewind just a moment and, and talk about the, the, the context of this whole project. Yes. Uh, I, there's, there's, and why I was there, how I ended up getting there. Um, so uh, the, uh, uh, the Yawanawa, the, the chief of the Yawanawa, Yawanawa Tashka, he, uh, as, a, as a child, uh, was, uh, suffered some severe illnesses. So he had malaria and yellow fever. And his father, um, you know, asked some Westerners to uh, take their child uh, and see if they could uh, use modern medicine to help him. And he got ex ended up going back to England and getting exposed and going to hospitals, getting exposed to Western culture. Uh, he, so he kind of had, was a man who had a foot in each world. Uh, so he had his family at home in the Amazon, uh, but he was also going back to England and uh, getting an education and advancing his education. So he was a man who was uh, uh, deeply involved in both worlds and uh, still is. And um, he met the director of our film, uh, Lynette Walworth, uh, who's this amazing multimedia artist. She had just done a piece about uh, uh, an aboriginal tribe that had been uh, pre-contact exposed to nuclear blasts uh, in Australia. Um, and they had, they had no idea that what they were seeing. Um, and they ended up getting like really bad radiation exposure, et cetera. Um, so she was showing that at some uh, international film festivals and uh, social entrepreneurship uh, meetings, et cetera. And that's where she met uh, Tashka. Um, so they met when she showed him virtual reality, which she is a virtual reality artist and she works in a various multimedia. Uh, he said, this, uh, this media, this is so familiar to me because it's very much like the medicines that we take. Uh, you see vibrant colors, it takes you to another place. It imparts a message. Uh, for him, it seemed like this is the perfect analog uh, to what we do when we take these uh, hallucinogenic medicines, right? So um, for him, he, he identified it, they clicked immediately, and she wanted to come and uh, uh, tell the story of, of the message that they had for the rest of the world. Uh, so that's kind of the context of this. Now. Um, but there was a prophecy you would come as well. That's what true. What is an adventure that's, without a prophecy, sir? That's, that, <laughs> Tell us of the prophecy. Yeah, okay. So um, 
Tata was the older shaman, and Tata had always said that there will be um, people that come from the outside world, and they will seek us out, and we'll tell them their, our story, and uh, we will disseminate our story and speak to the world. Um, so when, when we went there, that was a recognition of, of, of his dream, of what he saw for the future. Um, so that was kind of special, and, and I think that um, that helped the collaboration um, because everybody understood the context of what was happening. Is that this is their opportunity to speak to the world? Yeah. Can you talk about because you're you're in an ambiguous realm of like documentarian, ethnography, anthropologist, but then when these communities are inviting you and they're like, let's let's yeah. share this and let's become collaborators. But you're bringing the kind of otherworldly technology, and then, but they know what's sacred about their their narrative, if you will. Like, these are what things we want to share with you. How, how do you that was kind a of make sense super of that? interesting process. So, um, just so the the rest of the audience knows, um, when you're making a virtual reality film, it's very different than when you're making a more traditional documentary, where in a traditional documentary, you might spend a lot of times on the sidelines, just waiting pe for people to get used to you being there and ignoring you, and then you kind of capture their uh, unscripted moments. Uh, with the state of the art of virtual technology right now, it's not really in a state where you can be uh, uh, you know, 50 feet away and just kind of be a, a, an observer, a little fly on the wall. Uh, you actually have to kind of be, in order to create a, a good virtual reality experience, you have to be in the middle of the event, of the action, and you need to be close to everybody that you're trying to record. So the state of the art of the, the, the technology and the media kind of requires a, a deeper integration with the, the people that you're documenting. And it's really only fair as well to offer people the opportunity to co-create with you and to share in that documentary process. So when we went there, it was it ended up being a, um, I think it was like an eight day trip total, something like that. I know that we had five days to shoot. That was the part I was like most. Would you like to show the orb to show what the tech is? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah right. sure. <laughs> Yeah. So that people know this is what the VR camera was. Okay. Yeah. So there, there are. Uh, the, we used several d different rigs, several different technologies. Uh, this is what we used during the day. So this is kind of the um, uh, most of the shots were done with this camera. Um, as you can see, it it has a, a lot of lenses. And let's see, maybe I'll turn that towards the camera. Uh, so we can see that a little better. Um, each of these lenses has 120 degree field of view. So, you know, you can imagine it. It, it actually even captures what's behind the lens because this lens is capturing this way and this one's capturing this way. Um, so this allows you a complete spherical view. It also allows you to take advantage of having two eyes, the, the spacing of these lenses is about the same as the spacing between your eyes. So you get a stereoscopic view, at least facing forward. Um, it kind of falls off after objects kind of get over here. It kind of becomes more mono. But the idea is that that's behind you, and you wouldn't see too much of that. Uh, so this is the camera we use during the day. Um, this is no longer the, the state-of-the-art camera that you would use for creating a VR experience. but um, this is what we had available, and we used multiple other camera systems as well. So we had camera systems that were designed around low light for the ceremony. Uh, we uh, also used laser scanning, uh, fluorescent photography, photogrammetry, which is creating 3D models from drones. So those are kind of the different. So what's your definition of photogrammetry? Uh, creating 3D models from photographs. OK. Yes. And so how did, that, how did photogrammetry play out in this project? Yeah, so um, maybe we should, um, uh, let's see, maybe we could step back for, from a few images. So I think that you know, we started with the map uh, of where we were. And 
um, uh, kind of the, uh, what it took to get there. Um, then we, uh, we went on basically a very long journey to get there, you know, traveling. What was that journey? What are some of the, the details of yeah. <laughs> so we, bugs in your eyes and things yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. We, um, it, it, it was basically going on, a, a, you know, taking, taking a flight down to Lima and then cutting over to Sao Paulo. Uh, I think we had layovers even further south than that. Um, getting on smaller and smaller and smaller planes. And so we eventually hit a road and then we drive for a day and then we spend the night somewhere and then we spend another day uh, uh, taking this very long boat ride, which you saw some of it in high speed there. And then these are the boats that we took down and you can see that uh, you know they've all got their, their props are, are at an angle very far back because there's so many logs going over the river that you have to have that kind of uh, steep or uh, uh, that kind of gradual angle going down so that you could shoot your boat over the logs uh, riding to get there. Um, and then we eventually end up at the image that you see there where that is the, that bridge is kind of an important uh, monument in the, uh, uh, within the village. Um, because it kind of separates the, the realm where you have ritual uh, from the realm where you live. What is the realm of ritual? What, well, what it's that? where the sacred sites are. So the sacred sites are on the opposite side of the bridge. And it's when a you tree, see, right? Like there's a sacred tree on yeah, the bridge? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Sama Uma tree is this large uh, tree. And we've got a little footage of the area where the ceremony occurs. So you can see there's this enormous... Uh, mother tree there, and uh, that's where the various ceremonies would happen. So if someone's sick, they go to the tree and take ayahuasca together and yeah, things like I, that? I, <laughs> I think that's, that's part of it. It was more of a, a, a community action. People would bring their own uh, concerns uh, to that uh, ceremony. Concerns for what? Uh, spiritual concerns, uh, concerns for their family, these sorts of things. What would like a, an example of spiritual concern of that community be? Um, I wish I could speak more directly of to course, that. Of course, of course. But um, if, 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 I, if I were a shaman and, and had been raised, I'm sure I could give much more clear examples. But that was part of the experience uh, of the Yawanawa, was that's, that's where they turn for their spiritual uh, fulfillment and their spiritual needs. <laughs> So would it be accurate to characterize this project as twofold? You have the narrative of the first female shaman in this ancient culture, and then secondly, to use the most advanced VR technology available to empathetically convey what it's like to go through these rituals with these medicines. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And it, and you know the and as I was saying, these documentaries are are were kind of made uh, in collaboration uh, with the Yawanawa. So they. Um, you know, initially we kind of walked in. Uh, Tashka, the, the chief, knew very well what we were doing. The, you know, he was familiar with the experience of using VR. Um, but then we would bring in the, uh, uh, the hardware and we would do captures to kind of explain to everybody in the community what we were doing. So we would shoot samples. And this is by showing that to them, we were able to get them to be uh, willing collaborators with us. So here we have this. Uh, this is the first time they've ever experienced VR. This is the first time Amazing. they've experienced hmm. VR, for well, sure. And what did that feel like to you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm betting there are probably people in this audience here tonight who have not experienced VR. Right. Um, so it was, it was very exciting to show people and share it, and people got it right away and they immediately started engaging. And that was the exciting part, was that they quickly became collaborators. Uh, we, we filmed some ceremony, and they were like, the, these, uh, uh, what we filmed here is not very, like, this is not what we want, the way that we want to share our culture with the world. Like, we want to share it in a different way. So, um, for instance, they're like, you know, when, when there's a, high ceremony, we, we dress in traditional dress. 
you know, if it's a cat, you know, there might be casual things that happen on a Wednesday night that you don't dress up for. So our, our initial capture uh, uh, was was not in traditional dress. Um, there are things like plastic bottles around, et cetera, and they're like, this is not the way that we treat high ceremony. Um, so they actively got involved in art directing uh, a, a lot of the captures that we did. Mm -hmm. And because the captures can't really be done anonymously or as a fly in the wall type of capture, it kind of requires that level of collaboration uh, to create documentary. Yeah, there's also a very beautiful symbiosis here that you've been at the cutting edge of VR itself, really, for what, the past 20 years, and then you're showing the internal worlds that, but you're physically capturing right. an external thing. And so, like, yeah, you're connected in this deep, deep intrinsic way, if that makes sense, of yeah. your vision of this technology, even though you're coming from a great distance, is then representative of their internal dream state in a way. Right, and, right. And, yeah. and what I love is the collaboration and the possibility of learning from other people. So I, that's what I love about the experience. And I, I learned quite a bit about what they wanted to show. And, and I was thrilled to be able to assist and help in that. So how did you go about, because if you have, I don't know, it's like when someone talks about a dream, unless you lived through the dream, there's yeah. gonna be like an absence of a certain emotional knowledge. How did you go about approaching this as a VR cinematographer? And then what were the visual representations and sure. you know, things like that? Like sure, so uh, a lot of this was uh, based on the conversations that uh, Lynette had with Tashka, the chief. And um, you know, they, they kind of formulated a, a lot of what they, they wanted to express. And um, I had a meeting then with Lynette in which we were both like super geeks about uh, fluorescence and fluorescence photography, filming, these sorts of things. I, uh, uh, for some reason, uh, bioluminescence and fluorescence have always been a huge interest of mine. Um, and uh, so we started talking about uh, 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 what, how we wanted to express the, um, the experience of using the, the uni and the, the ayahuasca, and um, how, what, what are the best ways to express that. And a lot of what you see in, in kind of uh, um, uh, American culture, European culture, about um, hallucinogens, psychedelic art, it's, it's almost like uh, Alice in Wonderland, where you're, you go to a completely different world and everything is imaginary and it's an imaginary story. And what we wanted to do is to uh, take aspects of the real world and manipulate them. And so you're seeing the real world, but you're seeing it in a new way. So that was the, the goal. And then kind of looking at the technological tools that we had available to us uh, to express that. So for instance, one of the things that uh, uh, Tashka communicated to Lynette is that uh, you know, it's very important that you're in the forest and you're experiencing the forest, but the forest is also aware of you and it's reacting to you. So it's, it's a bi-directional experience. So the way that we tried to express that was by using uh, laser scanners where we were collecting um, data about the jungle and the environment uh, where we can move through it and you can get with extremely high precision the distance to every leaf and to every branch and, and every tree that you see. Um, but it's not a literal representation. Uh, it's colored by the points, but it almost looks like a star field. And in order to express the idea of the forest is also aware of you, um, we've got the, because we know that where someone's head is facing, uh, we can kind of get the position uh, from their head tracking of where they're looking of the, of the person who's experiencing this in VR. And it's manipulating this point cloud. And when you're breathing, the microphone is listening to your breathing and it's causing interactions uh, with that point cloud. 
So I think we've got, yeah, we've got some slides here going up uh, of point clouds and what point clouds look like from the VR experience. And so the, the device we had was called the uh, PX80. Uh, you can see it here. Um, it's a handheld device. It was the first handheld uh, th colored uh, laser scanner. So you could walk around with it, and it would get the color using a camera to paint the points the color of the environment. So that's what we used generally around the force at the time. There were only three of these in existence. It was a prototype, and uh, we took one of them up the Amazon. Um, nice. And then you you weren't doing this yourself, right? You had some some helpers that uh, they, they did field research. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, uh, do you want to talk about that process or no? Or yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I had two ACs that that were helping me, and they went to the site first, and uh, they had um, uh, they went and collected all kinds of great information uh, about you know things that we should bring with us, you know, what we should do to be prepared for insects, what we should uh, do to be prepared for sleeping, et cetera. Um, and they also had kind of tried every medicine uh, that was there, uh, which there are numerous plant medicines. Uh, and so, you know, we had a little bit of warning as to exactly um, uh, what we might be encountering. <laughs> And then what was the feedback you got on the kind of veracity of the experience from the members of the tribe? Yeah, well, that, that was the exciting part. So uh, immediately they started collaborating. Um, and then we also, um, we showed them things like the fluorescence. Uh, and uh, uh, the, I don't think we were able to show them the point clouds in on location. But the, the fluorescence, the fluorescence uh, filming, they responded to very strongly. And they're like, these are the, the visionary colors. This is the, uh, the color spectrum that we see the world in uh, when we experience the uni. So uh, it, was, it was very, uh, very affirming and uh, to kind of get that uh, endorsement uh, mm -hmm. of like, you guys are going down the right path. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, do you want to, are the caterpillars visual with, uh, just from the naked eye? When they're, are you just like surrounded by bioluminescent caterpillars that become yeah. butterflies? That, yeah, so, yeah. That all makes sense when you're in the okay, moment. Okay, so this is, yeah. this, is, uh, this is really interesting. So um, Lynette has a longtime collaborator that she's been working with. Um, uh, it's called, her name is Anya Sali, and she is a scientist has been researching uh, fluorescence for a very long time. In fact, she has discovered a number of the colors of uh, fluorescence. She mainly uh, researches coral. So she's discovered these in coral, and she's gotten to name several colors of fluorescence. How do you name a color? That's <laughs> Well, when you scientifically discover it and where it comes from, and you get to describe it in scientific papers, you get the opportunity to name it's it. It's like owning a species kind of thing? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, like mm. all the unusual names. Yeah. Uh, so she's got a lot of experience of, in this, and uh, she was a, a really incredible collaborator to have on the project. And kind of the way our days were structured is that uh, during the day, we would be out shooting. There would always be a thunderstorm in the afternoon. Um, the camera would overheat just before that, so it kind of worked out okay. Um, so the camera would overheat, we'd, we'd go take a little nap, then come back, start shooting again. And then she would come out as soon as we stopped working and started working on backing up data and, and kind of getting all the footage together from the day um, and doing rushes and all of this sort of stuff. And uh, she would go out, put on uh, very long boots, um, basically, none of us were able to kind of go anywhere on our own because uh, there are deadly snakes. Oh, yeah, talk about uh, the things that could kill you and yeah, how, you, yeah. how you dealt with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are a few things that can kill you out there. Um, in, in addition to the insects, which we didn't have it that bad. We did have to sleep in mosquito nets and those sorts of things. But um, 
I've heard very bad stories about people uh, in, in the Amazon, uh, depending on the season, uh, uh, but we didn't have terrible mosquitoes. There were deadly snakes everywhere. Um, there was a point where, uh, uh, as we're, we're trying to reach our destination, uh, I jumped out uh, uh, of our canoe to, to take a little swim and cool off because it was crazy hot. Um, and everyone comes running up to me screaming, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee. And I was like, I'm, I'm fully dressed, uh, I'm an adult, I'm, I'm, I'm not peeing, but why are you so concerned? <laughs> and they started describing the parasite that, that, that you can get um, if you pee in the water that, that follows your stream of urine and climbs up your urethra and attaches itself. And <laughs> then you have to take a helicopter flight out mm. uh, it's I wonder if a scientist claimed that one. <laughs> <laughs> who got to name that yeah. one? <laughs> and who did they name it after? The curse for centuries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so there were, uh, uh, you know, I kind of lost my spot, but we were, uh, more or less, we, we, we had all these uh, dangerous items around. I didn't encounter too many myself. We were there for a very short time. Uh, the only one I really encountered was in the morning when I got up to do my business and there was a huge snake in the toilet. Um, they had a, 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 a great porcelain toilet with a leash field. They had for visitors, uh, very, very nice, very uh, top of the line stuff, except for the snake. Um, that was in the toilet that would have killed me if I uh, used it. Uh, so I went out and I found some uh, children that, that were able to remove that snake. God bless the children. Yes. Huh? Like, yes. Oh, and how did you, you, there's a language barrier, right? So yes. did you pantomime that? What was Yeah, the, there was yeah. a little like, <laughs> you know. hmm. uh, and, and I, I was trying to, explained to you know the first people I saw when I came out, which happened to be a bunch of kids. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, in there, there's a snake. And uh, yeah, and they, they ran in there, they took care of it. And then I asked later, I'm like, so what was the deal with that snake? And they're like, oh yeah, that was a deadly snake. You hmm. would have died. If you... <laughs> Not that high end of toilet, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, sending a child in to do a man's job. Yeah. Time on our tradition, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, just a little more somber. You're there and the elder shaman's dying and you're trying to, you have a, a limited time frame to create this sacred interpretation yeah. of this community. And there's this enormous transition with the first female shaman kind of coming to her own. What was the, I guess, communal zeitgeist, the zeitgeist within that? community at that time, you're yeah. there, because there, there is a, a desperation of sorts as well to get everything done and share the sacred things, right? Right, like, right, because, yeah. I mean, Tata, who's the elder shaman, um, uh, he was in his 90s when we started the project, and I was actually not there uh, when, when he passed. So he passed before we arrived. Um, so uh, luckily, when we sent our ACs there, they caught some beautiful beautiful shots uh, of, uh, of kind of the uh, final hours and final days uh, of Tata um, and the community's reaction to that. So they're very touching, moving moments in the film. And, um, you know, it, it was a real honor that we got to in, include that in the film. And then what was it like in that aftermath? Um, was there chaos? Was it harmony? Was it... What's, what's well, um, I think we ended up following us a number of months later, so some time That wasn't passed. a direct aftermath. Thing. Yeah, it was, not, it was not directly after, but uh, what was um, interesting was to see how much everyone in the community uh, really honored Tata and, and how much esteem they had for Tata. Uh, that was touching. That was touching to experience. And then what was the mechanism of his transmitting the cultural knowledge? Because if it, uh, we would think like, oh, I have a book of the language or something like that, right? Like, what was the, yeah. the mechanism of going from almost being annihilated towards the culture lives on and maintains its traditions? Yeah, like, his, his family trained him in the language. 
Uh, they trained him in the plant medicine. And the language was repressed by the plantation owners, right? So, That's right. Yeah, okay. That's right. They were required to speak Portuguese. Um, and the um, there, there was also a lot of influence from missionaries, so they weren't allowed their traditional religious practices as well. And uh, Tata was the one that was able to kind of share all of this, reshare it with the rest of the community as, as they emerged from that period. So that was, that was very special. And um, he was a very special and insightful man that uh, uh, you know, had the, the, the foresight and you know, uh, Hushahu made such a convincing argument and was so insistent that, that she become a shaman and she knew it from the beginning. She identified it from the beginning. So that was, I think, the, the thing that gave him, made him believe that he was doing the right thing. And, and one of the uh, convincing arguments they had is that, uh, you know, Hushahu saw the spirits when she took the uni. And it's like, who are you to uh, contradict the spirits? You know, if the spirits showed themselves to her, then it must be admissible to do that with women. And it, it, it spurred a cultural revolution within their culture. Um, and now they, there are female chiefs, uh, so, and they share uh, chiefship with men. So there's like seven uh, female chiefs, chiefs and seven male chiefs, and they, they share that power, and they're, they're sharing across all different aspects of the culture. And they've regained a lot of their language uh, they've regained their traditional knowledge of medicines. And uh, Hushahu, when she went through her training, um, when she emerged from that, um, the, the, uh, the vision that she had uh, emerging from her training was of a butterfly uh, that came and landed near her and spoke to her about the strength of women and the stories of women. And she related these stories. And she also heard the songs, uh, the songs of the frog, the songs of the anaconda, uh, different songs from the uh, animals in the environment that they're surrounded by. And she would tell Tata. And Tata would say, oh, these are the songs that we lost. These are, you have, you have rediscovered the spirits have brought these songs back to you, and we can uh, now incorporate these songs into our culture. And they also came with imagery. Um, and they made whole uh, beaded patterns. So their artwork then would reflect this. So it, these transformations ended up having kind of a ripple effect through the whole culture and uh, kind of brought a lot of their culture back to life. Hmm. Do you think you can understand the Anaconda song, or do you have to be born into that and have that relationship with the jungle? Like... I got to say, our sound recordist did a beautiful job. We have all this um, uh, for parts of the audience that that are not familiar with the, the sound recording techniques. There's a technique called ambisonic, where you can get uh, it's kind of like an infinite number of surround channels. Uh, so it's a method of getting very directional sound. We've got all these wonderful. Uh, recordings of the songs being sung that you can hear in the VR experience. Um, so we, we've got a lot of those. So I think that you can appreciate uh, those songs. Um, we'll never have the cultural context to like truly understand them, but they're beautiful. And um, uh, we, I think we've been able to bring those back in a very special way. Uh, and just a bit of the, the kind of yeah the cultural context. What is a, a chief and what does a female chief mean? And then can you talk about the, I guess the irregular family structure, like the forty nine sibling story, oh, right, and, and how right. they're coming back and how that's a part of their renaissance as a society. Sure. Well, I think that was I think that was something that happened earlier when the, when there was more pressure on the society to. Uh, so basically, what I'm referring to, the population dwindled to extermination levels, yeah. and then new family structures emerged. Right, and, yeah. right. Well, uh, and and um, I, w I want to be careful about how I, 
I state that because uh, uh, the, the best, my best description is uh, one story that I heard, uh, which is uh, Tashka uh, told me, um, he was telling me story after story, and um, he kept on referring to his brother or his sister. And um, after a number of stories, I, I was like, what is the, um, how many brothers and sisters do you have? And he said, I have 49 brothers and sisters. And uh, uh, I was like, well, how? Like I've how, known some great women, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. like uh, did your father have, you know, marry multiple women or are these half brothers and half sisters? It's like they're, they are all full brothers and sisters. And, um, it was kind of posed almost as a riddle uh, uh, to me. And, and uh, his, uh, his father had married uh, seven sisters. So all of his brothers and sisters have the same four grandparents. So they really are all full brothers and sisters. But I think that this is, you know, um, when you're under immense pressure, uh, uh, you know, you, you have to come up with... Um, new ideas about how you're going to um, grow your population, right? Mm -hmm. cool. um, are there other things you'd like to share? Yeah, we uh, we can, we've got a bunch of... Let's do the slide land. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we've got a bunch of slides of things. I think we've kind of ignored the slides uh, going through this presentation, but we can take a look at them now. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, so one of the, the group of slides here we've got is the um, uh, uh, face painting. Uh, uh, before the ceremony, it's tradition that they have face painting of all the uh, little girls in the community gather and they do face painting. And this is uh, Tashka, the chief. And here we've got, you, this is uh, 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 Tashka. And um, here we've got a, a demonstration that it's definitely uh, uh, the Yawanawa are modern people, and they live in two worlds. You know, they live in their own world, but they're also connected to the modern world. Um, they, you, you can see all the bright red paint that they're using. Um, that's something that they uh, cultivate to sell to makeup companies for lipsticks. Um, they've got a lot of unique uh, plants and uh, access there. Uh, here we've got the use of the um, uh, tobacco, which is the, uh, the snuff that they use, which is a spiritual practice. So here you see the snuff um, being uh, uh, used by the chief. So someone else blows the snuff uh, into your nose. And uh, I actually brought some to the club here. So if anyone wants to try it here tonight, we've got, uh, we've got some in the humidor. Um, you, I, I've got a little device that lets you do it yourself, um, but traditionally it's done uh, from a partner, uh, kind of blows that up your nose. Um, you see stars, it's made from wild tobacco and the ash of a bunch of different exotic trees. Uh, it's very painful, you see stars, um, it's maybe subtly hallucinogenic, kind of hard to say, at least from the amounts that I've done. I quickly turned green and, and puke uh, when I try it. Um, but uh, it's something that they combine with prayer. Um, uh, so you can see. I find there. vomit and prayer to be best as well. So. Uh, they, don't, they don't vomit when they do it. Uh. I, but I, I'm a little bit of an amateur. Um, uh, but I like it. What I like about it is that uh, it takes me back to the jungle. It reminds me of when I was on that boat and uh, uh, traveling and hearing all these stories from Tashka and uh, uh, the, uh, the other folks there. And um, I can literally smell the same trees around me. So uh, when, when I use that, I'm, I'm transported. Is that like hearing a song from high school kind of thing, or is it a deeper... <laughs> moment. Like, it, uh, it's visceral. It's yeah. very visceral. I am immediately taken back. I don't know if other people who try it have that mm. 
experience. Uh, here you can see where, where we're showing everyone the virtual reality experience. So uh, in this case, we had kind of a, uh, you know, at the time it was a very poor man's VR where you slap a cell phone and a piece of cardboard with a couple of lenses. And uh, you could look around using that to see the VR. So that, that was the way that we were able to kind of let everyone know what was going on and, and get them as collaborators. And when you say collaborator, what does that really mean versus just consent or help? Yeah, no, the, I, I, I feel that they helped us make this film because they, they had the message that they wanted to send. You know, it was their message, and it was representing their culture. And um, I think that it was a good thing to have them help influence that. And I think that our story is more true because of that. What are we looking at here? <laughs> yeah, so uh, these are uh, just the, the kids. So this is uh, uh, an important shot uh, in the film. We have kind of a, um, maybe at the beginning of this, we have an uh, image that almost looks like a mirrored sphere uh, that shows the kind of full 360 output. Uh, there you can see the little camera uh, supported there. And uh, in the background, we've got um, uh, different people uh, looking at the virtual reality experience. So this is all before the shoot. I had a, an opportunity to kind of run around with a long lens and look at all of these slides and next we've got here kind of my uh, one of my favorite slides which is uh, the next generation of virtual reality creators yeah. you know, by getting to to share this with them and here we've got uh, 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 we've got Lynette and uh, Tashka and his wife Laura uh, both named Yawanawa um, and Nicole Noonman, who was uh, the producer of the event, or of the, of the project. Hmm. And, uh, oh, this was the good news. We, we won an Emmy. Oh, well then. Um, <laughs> for the project. <laughs> so, but this was a pandemic Emmy, right? <laughs> this was a pandemic uh, Emmy. So uh, this uh, is the way I experienced it, was yeah. <laughs> uh, sitting in my living room uh, on my own, uh, watching it on a little uh, Apple TV app uh, that let me see our, our particular area, which was for documentary. And it was, a, you know, as, a, as an artist, you, you kind of always imagine like what that, that moment of gratification is going to be like. <laughs> and this is not the way I anticipated. I, I always expected everyone to be dressed really well and, and at a fancy dinner. Did you dinner. wear pants? Uh, <laughs> it's not about them, it's about uh, you. Yeah, yeah, I may have been wearing basketball shorts. Okay, okay. Uh, when I got Miami. Um, <laughs> but uh, the moment where it became real, it, so it was kind of surreal. It was just like, kind of like it came on, it was like, oh, we won. And so I turned the TV off, I'm like, wow, that's weird. So I guess I won an Emmy now. And uh, it just didn't feel... You know, it didn't have the type of feeling I was expected. Was it like a Zoom? Yeah, it was like a Zoom meeting okay. uh, where they're like, you won. And it was, it just, it felt strange. But the moment where it did become real uh, is when uh, Grace and my friend Paul came over and I, I, I received the Emmy in the mail, you know, like a month later. And um, I, I waited to open it until, you know, my friends came over and we went outside. Uh, because it was in the middle of the pandemic, and you know, uh, those were rough times. Um, so that was that was my experience of of winning an Emmy. Hmm. <laughs> she had a private ceremony. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was. It was very. It was very uh, intimate and and close. Are we? What's that slide there? Are we at the end of the slides? I think that I think that is complete. All right. Can you describe this last slide? <laughs> Uh, the one of the current slide. The All current. The ma oh, that's the Emmy moment. Yes, that's, ah, yes. That's the Emmy moment where we walked out to the beach okay. uh, to 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 get a photo, yeah. a little photo op there. So, how do you feel talking about this now in this moment, looking back on all the things and your career as a someone who 
you know, you, you pedal in your own imagination, right? And now you're sharing yeah. others and what's real, what's not, all, all the big questions. I mean, for me, I, I love the collaboration and the learning. Um, I, I had all the tools, I had the creativity, but I didn't have the, um, the inspiration. This is not a story I, ever I would have ever told had you know, there not been a Lynette, Natasha that, that, that made, made that happen, exposed me to this whole world. So I was uh, super thankful for that. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a great time. And then to, the, the Emmy was an unexpected benefit. Um, uh, so that was, that was, you know, there, there were a lot of other great works. And, you know, Lynette and I have talked about this a number of times. Of that. There's so much good work that's done that, that doesn't get the recognition. So it's not, you know, necessarily that we were so outstanding that we were the only ones that could have won that. But um, maybe you were. <laughs> maybe, but the, the, the other side of the coin is I, I spoke to another friend about it where they said, you know, it's not, it's not this piece, it's like all the pieces you've done, all the work you've done, all the years of toiling. And, and you know, a lot of the other projects you've done were probably also very deserving projects, but they didn't win that year. So, so um, I, I, I just like to recognize all the other artists that have done incredible work and um, uh, uh, am and, and thankful that I eventually got some great recognition for that. It's so cool you're giving your post-pandemic Emmy acceptance speech. Yes, right, right now. now. This, is it. Like... this was my only opportunity because <laughs> nice. during the pandemic. Ah, well done. There was no one around me. There's no one around me then to talk about that. Thank you. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? We do. Marvelous. <laughs> Um, you can hang out after the show. Uh, that, it's, it, it's, it's a bit long, so it's like you know, 15, 17 minutes, something like that. So we can get a couple of people through probably. Um, if not, uh, grab my card. Uh, you can stop by my studio in Long Beach and check it out. Um, go to Greg's studio in Long Beach, okay? I just that be my recommendation. Um, and he has a lot of other awards there, and I was fooled into thinking they were all Emmys. Uh, can Phoebe possibly bring up the photo slide of the fabrics that you had there, or can you speak to Oh, them? of the beaded patterns? The beaded patterns, yeah. because uh, having to spend eight or nine days with archaeologists and astronomers in Mesoamerica, I'm looking at the two at the top right, and I'm seeing like night skies and star fields, and did Tosca ever kind of go into that realm in her learnings about the voices of the animals and whatnot? Did she ever talk about the night sky and any of that? Or can, do you have any sense of that? I know that the night sky is important to them and they're very aware of everything that's happening in the night sky. Uh, you can see the Milky Way incredibly clearly there. They've got uh, an incredible view of the sky, uh, although it, it, it is blocked in by trees a lot. But um, um, I, I would imagine that they probably have a deep connection, a lot of stories about the sky, but that's, that's not what the focus of our uh, project was. Can you speak about who made those? Yeah, so the, the patterns uh, end up getting repeated. Um, so the patterns are from uh, vision quests. So they're, they're, uh, they come to them in a vision. Um, they're given, stories are applied to them. So uh, whether it's a story of an animal um, or, you know, I imagine they may have other stories too, but the, the stories of the animals are the ones that I heard. And um, the patterns they create, they, they then kind of reflect these patterns in the, everything from the face painting to the beadwork to all different aspects of their uh, expression. Thank you, Greg. 
Yes, I was um, curious, how large of a crew do you bring on an expedition like this? Yeah, so uh, this, this was, um, let's see, we had uh, uh, Lynette and Nicole, the producer, and uh, we had uh, a sound recordist. Uh, we had my two ACs, myself, um, of course, uh, Tashka and Laura Yan Yawanawa lived there. Um, there's Hushahu, who the story was about. Um, so she's playing a primary role. Um, so I think that's about it. And there, there's always people around to help. There are always people from the, their community that would help us in whatever we were trying to do. What human truth do you think that you, you saw, you experienced, you distilled from your experience? It's a deep question. Um, I was impressed by the resilience and the um, confidence that, that the Yawanawa had, that they had a message to share with us that was a message of love. And um, they wanted to share what they had with us. And, and I, I, was, I thought that was really beautiful. And I, I was impressed by that. Uh, as a veteran of double-digit Grateful Dead shows when Jerry Garcia was still around, I want to know about the ayahuasca. Yeah. Did you get to take any, what was it like? <laughs> and uh, did you need any special initiations to get the, the key to the kingdom? Right. Um, well, you'll be a little disappointed to hear that I did not get the true experience while I was there. Uh, this project was kind of crazy. and that, when I was first told that we would probably have five shoot days, I was like, this is, this is going to be an impossible project. There's no way we're going to come back with enough to make even a short film. Um, we got incredibly lucky. Every day we came back with fantastic material and a lot of it. And um, it, it, that part was really beautiful. But. The other side of that is that we were working our butts off the entire time we were there. There was no time to uh, uh, get experimental. And on the final evening that we were there, um, and we were starting to wrap the footage, um, you know, uh, we asked them about that, and they were like, "No, no, you can't. You shouldn't be doing this because you're you're working." Uh, you need to, you know, you need to tell this story, and uh, you know this should not be part of your experience. They did on the very last evening, when we wrapped at, you know, midnight or something like that. And, every, and this is in the middle of ceremony, so everybody is, is, uh, it's an ayahuasca ceremony, and there's uh, dancing and singing, and uh, it, it seems like a really great experience. They did allow us to, to try some, but they gave us child doses. Um, so I, I didn't feel anything from it, but I did get to taste it. So I, I got familiar with the taste of it, but um, I didn't get the, the actual experience of it. Do have time? One more question, and then. <laughs> so. I read about the Yadamamo Indian tribe down there and about ayahuasca way back in the day, and they said that the chiefs would take it so that they could like fly over hills and see where they want to take their tribe next or, mm -hmm. or fight their fears, like snakes. A lot of snakes were like yeah. the big thing. What did he say? He, was it more prayers for healing, or what were they like doing ayahuasca for? Uh, I, I wish I had a more complete answer for you, but... Um... I know that it was about spiritual endeavors and it was about concerns. So when you're concerned about something, and whether that's you have to travel, you have to make a big life decision, uh, someone's sick or injured, um, these are the types of things that you pray for. Hmm. That's all we have time for, noble sir. Thank you very much. Right, thank you.
And thank you very much for tuning in out there in internet land. Please like, subscribe, share. And if you're ever in the Los Angeles area, come on down, so to speak. Thank you very much for tuning in. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.